What's up, future respiratory therapist? So I got another video here for you. I'm going to do something on my own now. I got lots of questions, but I'm going to get to them in a minute. I, I want to do this for you because I said I was going to in my last video. So I'm going to talk about mechanical dead space. But before I get into mechanical dead space, let me just address an email I received. And if you haven't noticed, there's an email in the description posting of this video. And that email is there for you to send questions to or comments or concerns or anything you want to know. Now a lot of times people just put questions in the comments and that's perfectly fine. But if you're not comfortable putting questions in the comments, then send me an email. I'll answer it, okay? And I'll give you a shout out just like I do everybody else, okay? So here we go. Warda wants to know if I have any tips for motivation for respiratory therapist students studying. Now, this is an interesting question because I don't think I've ever gotten this one before. And it's simply this, like I said before, do I have any tips for motivation? Do I have anything that I can motivate students to study? And yeah, I do. It's simply this. Your patient could die. When you complete your school and you become a practicing respiratory therapist, if you don't know the things you need to know, then your patient could die. That's the only motivation you need. There's nothing else more important than that statement. It's period. Like you don't want to study? Then don't study. You don't want to be great at your craft because you don't want to study? Then don't study. But if you want to be great at what you're doing and you want to make an impact in the field of respiratory therapy, then you have to study and you have to become knowledgeable in these critical thinking areas. And that's the end of the story. If you don't, then your patient could die. That's all I have to say. Water. That's my words for you. You want motivation to study? Your patient could die. Period. End of story. Okay? Now, for the rest of you, for this video as it goes on, we're going to talk about mechanical dead space. Mechanical dead space. Not anatomical dead space. Not physiological dead space. We're talking specifically about mechanical dead space. And you need to know what mechanical dead space is. So I'm going to put it on the board here. This is mechanical dead space. Okay? Now, what we know is we have a ventilator and we have a patient. Okay? So this is the vent. Ventilator, ventilator, patient, patient. I'm going to create two different scenarios for you, and I'm going to talk to you about why one is mechanical dead space and why one is the other is not mechanical dead space. So from the ventilator, you have two Ys, an inspiratory limb and an expiratory limb. And then you have a Y. This Y is very important. It is what differentiates between where the valves open and close, okay? So in this case, you have a Y, a y the patient's Y, the ventilator Y is very close to the patient. But in this case, you have a Y that is very far from your patient. Now, many of you may would say, well, both of those are mechanical dead space. If you have a lot of tubing, Going to your Y, yeah, that's mechanical dead space. This is also mechanical dead space. But the truth is this. The closer to the Y, the closer the patient is to the Y, the less mechanical dead space. The less mechanical dead space. Now, I know you can't read that because I messed it up. But when you look at this one, this equals mechanical dead space. This is bad. 
Why? Because there's a lot of distance between the ventilator circuit Y and the patient. Your Y, your, 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 your ventilator circuit Y is important because at the end of inspiration and the beginning of exhalation happens right here. So when the patient exhales, all the air goes in to the expiratory side. This is expiratory. This is inspiratory. So all of the air goes here. When the patient inhales, they get air from the inspiratory limb. That's important. That makes this, no matter how long, how long this is. Look, we could, we could do this like this. Put the ventilator here. You still have no mechanical, virtually no mechanical dead space here, but this equals mechanical dead space. Let me show it another way. Let's take the ventilator back here. Here's your Y. And you've got this much more tubing to your actual patient. This equals increased mechanical dead space. This equals minimal dead space. Why? Because your mechanical ventilator Y is close to your patient. Anytime your Y gets further away from your patient, then you have an increase in mechanical dead space. Now, this typically does not come into talk much until we start talking about addition of circuitry. So, if you use the Aerogen ultrasonic nebulizer, then you probably have it back at the heater. Or you have it in line on your inspiratory side. That's fine. That's fantastic. But if you're using a small volume nebulizer, and you have to plug in a T adapter, and that T adapter has to be put somewhere into the circuit, then you're either putting it into... The inspiratory limb of the Y, which is correct. Or you're putting it after the Y and then adding six inches of flex tubing so that your circuit will then connect to your patient's endotracheal tube or the suction catheter of the endotracheal tube. Even the suction catheter alone, if it has an extended piece of of a flex tubing that connects to the Y, then that becomes dead space. Now, why is dead space important is the problem because if you increase mechanical dead space, then you're going to decrease alveolar ventilation. Let me say it again. If you increase mechanical dead space, like this illustration, or let me give you another one. Let me, let me, let me, let me make it even clearer for you, okay? You have your ventilator circuit, the inspiratory limb comes here, the expiratory limb comes here, and then you put a T adapter here, and you put an, a small volume nebulizer in here. And then it connects to the patients in the tracheal tube. This right here is mechanical dead space, and it will decrease the amount of alveolar tidal volume, meaning the amount of tidal volume that's effective in participating with gas exchange. If you put your T piece here and run back, then you're putting it before the patient's Y, and that does not increase mechanical ventilation. So my point is this. Between the patient's ventilator Y, the Y on the circuit, the inspiratory limb comes to the expiratory limb. Do you have excessive amounts of tubing between the Y and the patient's endotracheal tube? And if the answer is yes, 
then you have an excessive amount of mechanical dead space and you need to figure out how to move it behind the Y, which in most cases is going to relate to the inspiratory side of things while you put a nebulizer in on the inspiratory limb. Okay, so understanding mechanical dead space is extremely important. Just because you have a long circuit doesn't matter. What matters is how close the ventilator circuit Y, the inspiratory limb meets the expiratory limb, how close is that to your patient? It should be as close as possible. And if it's not, then you have an increased amount of mechanical dead space and you should remove it. Because if you don't, then your alveolar tidal volume is decreased, which means your alveolar minute ventilation is decreased, and it's an extra imposed work of breathing on your patient. Hope this helps. Leave me a comment. Please subscribe if you haven't done, done so already. All that's going to happen is you're going to get some good content, informational content, a couple times a week into your inbox on your YouTube app, and you can watch it or not. Don't care. If it helps you, keep watching. If it doesn't, then don't. I'm just here to try to promote knowledge and to promote learning for the people that are trying to become exceptional respiratory therapists. If that's you, subscribe, like, and comment. Best wishes.